We've spent the past 18 months working on an incredible new project, and we are almost ready to announce it to the world. We're stoked, all right? I'm about as excited as I am when I see a plate of buffalo wings in front of me. In fact, I would even say more so to announce this, all right? This is going to make an enormous difference in how beginners get started in fly fishing. And we're also going to be announcing a huge giveaway. So you're definitely going to want to stay tuned for this entire episode. This is Untangled Fly Fishing for Everyone, presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey, everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled, and I am your host, Spencer Durant, joined in studio today by none other than VFC co-founder Alex Stoltz. Howdy. How's it going? Good. I got to be on my best behavior today, don't I? Yeah, you better watch out. Now, when the boss comes <laughs> around, I have to uh, make yeah. sure I'm not whatever, not screwing around too much a little bit. Spencer he, calls the shots around here. He, He's all talk. He cracks the whip on me pretty good. You know, <laughs> it's a uh, it's pretty strenuous work environment over here these days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. Well, this is our it's turning into a monthly thing now yep. where you're here. And we're, we get to chat every month. And this is a special episode, though, because. It's not just our usual get together and chat episode. We've got a huge announcement to make, and I'm not overselling this at all. I promise. This thing is huge. We have been working pretty hard over the last 18 months, two years. Yeah, 18 since I came on with VFC about 18 months ago. Yeah, yeah we've been putting this thing together. So we are really excited. We've got a really fun project, and you guys are going to hear all about it. Just got to stay tuned. All a lot, right. A lot of early mornings, a lot of yep. late nights, a lot of road trips, fun days out of the river, days where we yep. didn't catch any fish and had to redo lots of stuff. So I, I even gave up time with my mother-in-law for this project. Wow. I know. It's going to blow some people's mind. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Laura. Oh, I love my mother-in-law. I always have to say that because some people don't understand the, the joke. Uh, <laughs> so I always have to say it afterwards. Like, no, I actually do love my mother-in-law. <laughs> and I do, right? It's just the mother-in-law jokes have to be yeah, made. You it, know? It's needed. It's like picking on yeah. Colorado anglers. <laughs> it's just something that you have to do, right? For sure. Oh, well, before we get into our big announcement uh, and the big giveaway that we're doing at the end of the show. So definitely... Uh, you want to stay tuned for that too. Biggest giveaway we've ever done. It's and we're not being hyperbolic here. No, it is. It really is the biggest giveaway we've ever done. It is muy grande, which <laughs> for those of you who don't speak Spanish, is Spanish for much grande. All right. <laughs> Did I get that right, Alex? El Nino, Spanish for the Nino. Yeah. Alex's Spanish is so good. He got complimented by a Spanish-speaking lady the other day when we were at a, a restaurant. Yeah, actually, I was. Very proud of myself. Yeah, you should have been. I I said, infierno. And she went, wow, that was a great R. And I I was stoked. It was was pretty cool. It was a good time. (laughs) (laughs) Well, anyways, before we get into the show, though, uh, one quick call to all of the viewers, listeners out there. First off, thanks to everybody who listens to the show, watches us on YouTube, follows along with us. All the comments. We love it. It's tons of fun. And that's why we're doing this stuff, to build this community and connect with everybody. But part of that is the questions for this show. Untangled was founded on answering questions, trying to help, right? That's why we created this show. I need questions from you guys, all right? No matter how big or how small the question is, you know, like the fish that I catch, because I catch some small ones, uh, your, your questions are worth answering, all right? We will continue doing giveaways tied to following the show and asking questions. But even when we're not doing the giveaways, I need you to submit the questions. Helps keep the show rolling. Helps keep everything fresh. And just keeps allowing us to to continue to do this and build the community that we've had so much fun doing over the last couple of years. So, all right. And with that, uh, like we said, we spent 18 months putting this new project together. and both the both Alex and I have a few things that we've learned that we would like to share with everybody. We are going to go over six things that we wish all beginner anglers knew because we believe that these are the six things 
that are actually going to make you a better angler in the long run. Like if I would known these six things when I started and it hadn't been my dad just handing me a fly rod and saying, don't get it tangled, you know, uh, <laughs> learning curve would have been a lot lower. <laughs> and my dad was a great teacher, but you know, he, he really wanted to fish a lot too. So my education was a lot slower and I don't blame him for that at all. You know, I think it worked out. Uh, but these are six things that we just wish everybody knew. We think it's really going to be helpful. Yeah. So we've been talking about how over the last 18 months we've been out on the river, we've mm-hmm. been doing this project and we've really had some time to reflect on exactly what we're doing out there when we're out on the water. And um, part of the, you may not know this, but VFC, we were founded on trying to make fly fishing easier for everyone. That's untangled fly fishing for everyone. That's the name of this podcast. Right. And so what we've really tried to do is we first started with fly collections. We said, you know, flies are kind of confusing. Uh, You walk into a fly shop, there's bins and bins, there's thousands of flies. How do we make that simpler? Okay. Let's create some fly collections where it's everything that you would need to just head out to the river and start fishing. If you were completely new, Uh, let's throw some pictures on there. Let's throw the names of the flies. Cause I mean, the guy comes up to you. Oh, what are you using? Our prince nymph. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> what's, what's that? A prince nymph. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's really what we've tried to do here at VFC is simplify things down as much as we possibly can. And so these are we we've just had a lot of time out on the river the last eighteen months to think about all of these concepts, and this is what we've learned. Yeah, and we have three each, so six total. Even us Wyoming kids can do math like that. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to go ahead and lead us off uh, with the first of our things. And I'm going to get I'm going to get a little bit of a soapbox here. All right. So I hope you're ready. Oh, boy. All right. My my number one thing I want to talk about that I wish beginning anglers knew. Picking flies. All right. I keep seeing this question in Facebook groups and in forums, and it's really kind of starting to piss me off. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, maybe maybe that's a little strong, but it's getting under my skin because it's the wrong question. And I think it's frustrating to me because I feel like we've done a disservice to so many new anglers by not communicating this effectively. And what I mean by this is the question I see all the time is what fly should I use or what are your go-to patterns? I see those all the time, all the time. And I think that question really misses the mark. This isn't bait fishing. That's not what we're, you know, it's not like you just tie on a treble hook with some rainbow garlic power bait, which is the best power bait, I might add. (laughs) Uh, And I'm not over, I I still fish conventional gear. I haven't bait fished in a while, but I troll for kokanee quite often. I've done it for lake trout. Uh, I ice fish still. So it's, I'm not coming from a holier than thou. It it only counts if it's caught on a dry fly, a fish downstream from a mode bank. (laughs) You know, I'm not, on that horse at all. I mean, that sounds like you out on the river most days. Oh, yes. A hundred percent. Complete with the pipe and the monocle, right? Yep. Yeah. But the reason why it's frustrating is your fly choice is so very rarely straightforward. Uh, just put this fly on and fish it and you're going to catch fish. And the, it's it's tough because a lot of new anglers, they just don't know enough to be confident about picking a few patterns that work in a wide variety of rivers. So I want to help you smash that learning curve a little bit. These would be my go-to, right? When somebody asks me, well, what flies do you use? What rig do you use? I'm like, well, it depends on the river. And it really does. But these are the flies that I use almost everywhere. Midges, caddis nymphs, and mayfly nymphs. Because they're in practically every trout river. In the, in the USA, you are rarely, if ever, going to go wrong by tying those bad boys on. These can be your go-to flies. These are your confidence flies. These are your rainbow garlic power bait, if do you, you will. Do you have some examples of each? Yeah, your zebra midge. Uh, so, caddis, so that's a midge. Yep, your caddis nymphs would be uh, your Frenchie or your pheasant tail. Uh, and then your mayfly nymphs would be like your hare's ear. Okay. So th- those are kind of the examples. And really... Like you look in my box, Alex, how many times have you looked in my box? Do I have a whole bunch of random patterns 
I can attest that Spencer does not have that many patterns, but he has a lot of different sizes and he'll change out maybe like a gold bead or a silver bead or yep. things like that. It's a lot more size shape oriented versus a bunch of different patterns. Yeah. And you know, I've, I've branched out a little bit. Like I've got some paradigms now. All right. <laughs> I've got a few. Dude, those don't have souls. I, I know the, their soul is fly. They're just fine. Thanks uh, Kelly. Uh, <laughs> Oh, but seriously, these, those three classes of flies that I mentioned, midges, caddis nymphs, mayfly nymphs, those can be your go-to. Newbies, right? We do. It's, it's in an upcoming project release. Oh, crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you'll, you'll see it soon. All right. Uh, and I'll, I'll get off my soapbox here, but I want to, I want to give you guys an example real quick. Uh, last week. Yeah, it was just last week. It, things have been a bore. Uh, <laughs> me and Alex, we were out on like a half dozen different rivers in the state of Utah. And the rig that I fished on all of them was a caddis dry fly with either a Frenchie or a zebra bitch nymph, depending on the depth that I wanted to reach. But that wasn't just random, right? You didn't just pull those out of your box before we got to the river. No, we were fishing stuff that I knew well enough. And I knew that caddis were coming off. Like we saw caddis coming off. Yes. And so I was matching to that, but I kept it that simple the whole time. And I know that those flies work because those bugs are so common and I know how to present. them. So that is my plea to all the newer anglers. Don't overthink the fly thing so much, but don't come into it thinking that it's a simple A plus B equals C thing either. There's some nuance to it. There's some variability to it, right? That's part of fly fishing is learning that. It's not this straightforward, like, what flies are they hitting on? It's not that simple. And you're doing yourself a disservice by thinking about it that way. You need to start thinking about it in terms of what bugs are hatching and what bugs are available to the fish. You start thinking about it that way. And that, that little paradigm shift is what that that flips the switch from just like muddling around with fly fishing to actually starting to understand it. Yeah, you're totally missing out on the learning opportunity. Yep. If you're asking people like, what fly are you using and what what did you catch fish on today? Like if you go and figure that out for yourself, yep. that is way more powerful than just having to rely on other anglers. Yeah. So I'm going to step off my soapbox here. All right, <laughs> Alex. And I'm going to turn the time over to you, man. Let's hear one of your uh, one of your lessons that you've learned that you want all these new anglers to know. Yeah. So actually playing off of that. Yeah. I will say that there are rivers where choosing the right fly is way more important mm-hmm. than than other rivers where maybe you have the right fly. It kind of sort of looks like what's out there and you're going to get fish, but there are other rivers where it's a lot more complicated and that's due to angling pressure. So So you're talking like, uh, the, that little, I mean, you might've heard of it. Um, I, I, and I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but I think it's the lower Bravo. Yeah. The, it's right next to the Madison and Henry's Fork, right? Yeah. Yeah. The lower Provo River, I think, there <laughs> in central Utah. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of angling pressure there. So, pressured tailwaters. Yep. Um, something that I've learned over the last few years um, is, I mean, let's, let's paint this picture. You have a river uh-huh. that um, has very specific bug hatches at pretty similar times of the year. You have a large city that's right next to it. And you have lots of people that go after work every single day and hit the river who drive their Lamborg. I kid you not. I saw a freaking Lamborghini SUV up there one time. (laughs) (laughs) They didn't even know they had. I didn't know they did either until that day. (laughs) Did I have a rod rack on top? No, thank goodness. (laughs) That would have been next level. That would have been. (laughs) Sorry. So you have a river. That gets fished like crazy. Like we were, we were actually driving past the, oh, sorry. We were actually driving past the lower Provo the other day to a different river. Right. Mm -hmm. And 
This is funny. We were like, all right, over under 35 cars parked at the spots here on the lower Provo. And I took the under. I thought that was pretty high. Everybody else in the car took the over. I lost 38 cars on a Saturday morning. Yeah. So you can imagine that those, the fish in that river see people a lot. They see flies a lot. They get caught a lot. And this is something that I didn't realize as a beginner was the river that I go to. Not all f- the fish are the same. Mm-hmm. They, there are fish that are way more picky, way more selective, way more keyed in on a specific bug. And it's, and even a specific fly. And you compare that to a river where it's never fished, really. Mm-hmm. You rarely see people on it. There's not a ton of bugs, so the fish are a lot more opportunistic. They'll kind of pounce on anything. It's, it's like a high mountain stream. The fish maybe aren't as big, but they're healthy. Mm. They're hungry. And so that's something that I've learned over the last two years is there is a big difference in, in the challenge for each water type. And beginners might not know that. They might go to those pressure tailwaters and they might go, holy crap like fly fishing is so hard these fish are so picky but not all rivers are like that if you actually uh, i I think each has its challenge you have your tailwaters you really have to do your homework on what bugs are there and match the hatch exactly you have to match the size the shape and the color like absolutely perfect and you have to get that presentation spot on yep and then there's The other challenge is finding rivers that aren't that pressured. You have to drive off the grid. You have to take dirt roads. You have to go three or four hours in the truck and, and do some exploring, which is actually a a total blast. That's, that's my favorite thing to do. The the tailwaters, I, they are fun. It's a challenge, but my favorite thing to do is just find some fish off the grid and, and it's a lot more fun for me. Yeah, it certainly is. And so don't, I, I think what you're trying to remind folks is don't like measure your success, especially early on and how well you do on the Madisons, on the greens, on the provos, yeah. on the snake rivers, uh, any of those big, really pressured rivers. Don't measure your success. And I want to say like, I love those rivers. Like the, I, I fish them all the yeah. time. I actually went, I may have gone to one of those rivers on my way to Spencer's house today. Possibly. The Madison's not on the way to my house, Alex. Neither is the Henry's Fork. Or is it? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't actually disclosed where you live. I could blackmail that. You could. Yeah. Yeah, you could. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, I appreciate it, Alex. So the next thing I think I want to talk about, uh, and you know, I'm just going to go right down this road because I think it ties in with what we've been talking about is presentation, man. And like we alluded to, and uh, there's a little short that we do for the podcast. So you'll see it on our social media if you're following us. And if you're not, well, what are you doing? Follow us. We're crying out loud. Come <laughs> we on. put so much hard work and effort. Do you have any idea <laughs> what it takes to wake up in the morning and go viral on TikTok? Because I do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Oh, no, but we did our little podcast short this week on presentation. And really, like, what it boils down to is, and I've told this story before, uh, the lesson I got in presentation, I was in Boy Scouts back in the day, right, back in Nam, and we were, uh, we were on this little mountain, real small, out of the way, middle of Utah, nothing really noteworthy about this mountain at all, except for its giant brook trout. Uh, <laughs> the folks who know will know anyways we're we're on this mountain for scout camp and we found this little stream behind this lake and there were enormous cutthroat in that stream now the cutthroat were probably like 15 inches which is a good cutthroat that's pretty good but to us you know i think we were like 14 15 the fish always seem bigger yeah they were enormous. Kid, for sure. enormous we were we were out of our minds and they just would not eat we were fishing worms on a hook and they were, and the cutthroat were taking one look at that going, Oh no, I'm not eating that. That's sus to use a word. The kids say these days, right? Uh, so we couldn't figure it out. 
So we go up and talk to our scoutmaster, Chad. Chad's one of the greatest guys I've ever met. Really knows his stuff. And Chad took one look at our rigs and said, well, of course they're not going to eat that. It looks like crap. Because it did. Our knots were awful. You could see the whole hook through the worm right there. <laughs> there was no subtlety to it at all. So Chad cut it all off, retied everything, and said, this is how you tie a clean knot. And the fish are going to eat it if it looks good. You've got you to gotta make it look appetizing to them. I was like, all right, whatever, Chad. What do you know? You're just an old guy. You're, you're kind of bald. What do you know, Chad? <laughs> well, it turns out Chad knew a whole heck of a lot because well, what did we do after we went down with our new rigs that Chad put on? You caught fish. We caught a whole bucket load of fish. We had dinner that night. Whoa. Yeah. So it was a, it was a big learning moment for me, and I've remembered that all the years later because it was just that little lesson of it's got to look good. It's got to look enticing to a fish. And that's, that's another big lesson that I think a lot of beginning anglers forget is it's not enough to just like put a fly out there, right? You can't just get a salmon fly and pop it out there and be like, all right, fish, jump into my net. It, it doesn't work that way. I would argue that presentation is much more important than even the fly that you have on most of the time. It can be. It can be. You, you can you can fish the wrong fly, but if you fish it well enough, fish will probably eat it. I agree. Right? As long as that presentation looks good, but you can have the perfect fly on. Perfect match for everything. And fish are going to ignore it because it just doesn't look quite right. So That, that drag on the surface. Yep. Um, you could even, I would say part of presentation is making sure that it's at the right depth. Yep. Um, yeah, so there, a there's a lot that goes into presentation. I guess, what are some things that go into presentation? What would you, if you were talking to a beginner angler uh -huh. and you're like, presentation is the most important thing. I tell him to watch me because I do it perfectly every time. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, for those of you in Rio Linda, that was a joke. All right. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, well, what I'd tell him, number one, look at the drag. Uh, whether you're fishing dry flies, dry dropper, or nymph rig. Drag meaning. Drag, if there's a wake going off behind the fly or your strike indicator at all, then that means it's not moving naturally. You want that to move naturally in the water. And that's the biggest issue that a lot of beginning anglers have is like figuring out what drag looks like and how to get rid of it. It's kind of like if you were to drop a leaf on top of the yep. water and just watch that leaf drift across the water's surface, that's how you want your fly or your indicator to look. Yep, it is. So that's the big thing uh, th that I'd tell you is make it look natural, make it look normal. And then the other thing, you don't want to use too thick of tippet either. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen some beginners that were using like 2X on everything. It's like, oh, it's 12 pound test. We, you know, I don't want the fish to get away. Well, okay, for a 10 inch brown trout, that's overkill. <laughs> All right. Now, flies is not going to drift naturally no. if it has that big of line. It's not because flies are nowhere near as big as lures or other rigs uh, that you're used to in conventional fishing. So it is a mindset change that you have to make. Uh, but it consistently blows my mind how fish get leader shy like that. Like you wouldn't think that they would, but they yeah. do. And we just see it time and time again. It's really interesting uh, how often that plays out. And where again, we fish. I think it comes back to that tailwater versus high mountain stream thing where um, a lot of the times if you're on that tailwater, tip it becomes even more important. Sizing yeah. down, making sure that it's drifting naturally. I've had some bad drifts on some high mountain streams and the fish still eat it. Yep. But they're a lot more forgiving. They're a lot more forgiving. But I would say the majority of the time, presentation is king. Yeah, 100%. All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to turn the time back over to you, Alex. So, as I alluded to, presentation isn't just about the fly floating on the water surface. No, it's not. Cuz you sometimes you use nymphs, sometimes uh -huh. you use streamers. And something that has been solidified to me over I'd say even the last 10 years. Uh -huh. Every time I go to the river, mm -hmm. Get the right depth. That's why you use the bounce rig so much, right? 
I do not use the bounce rig. Do you much. love the bounce rig? I sometimes it works better than bounce other rig ones. or bounce oh. off the river. That's your motto. Like I'm dry or die, and Alex is bounce or bounce, man. For the record, I outfished you like crazy at that river the other day with the bounce rig. Which one? You're gonna have to remind me. The one. That's- oh, you weren't using a bounce rig. You were fishing a dry dropper. No. Yes, you were. No, I wasn't. I watched you. The one up in northern. You know, like the furthest one away that we've gone to. Oh, okay. That that one. day, middle of the day, caddis were popping off. I threw on that caddis emerger oh, with the okay. bounce rig. It was like 20 to two fish. Okay. Yeah. I'll Slayed con- you in Berkeley. I will concede that. I will concede <laughs> that one. But the just last week on my, one of my little secret cutthroat streams I took you to. That oh, I wasn't using a bounce rig. Yeah, I know. You were fishing dry dropper. I thought that's the one. I prefer about. dry dropper. No, you prefer the mounts. No, don't I, don't let him don't let him fool you. I do not. Yes, you do. Anyways, <laughs> doesn't matter. What you know? What I prefer whatever rig gets the fly in front of those fish the best way. That's why I switched to a bounce rig yeah. one day because there's something. <laughs> now I'm on a soapbox here. Jeez, Spencer putting me on the spot. You're welcome. <laughs> So where those fish are hanging out, uh-huh. we're going to refer to that as the strike zone. Okay. So that's not like where I'm trying to pitch, right? <laughs> if this was baseball. No. Okay. This is fly fishing. All right. Jeez. I know. I'm newbie even, over here. Do you even know what we're doing? No, actually I don't. <laughs> I just showed up. We just play fly, fly anglers on TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, so, it's not far off. Uh, strike zone, where are the fish hanging out? I like to use the rig uh-huh. that gets those flies in front of the fish. Yeah. And that is determined by not just me showing up to the river. I love the bounce rig, which apparently I do. According to Spencer, that's all I use. Hey, Berkeley backs me up on that too. I used it freaking one time. No, it's been a whole lot more than once. Well, it worked. Yeah, it did. <laughs> it did. You're not wrong. So you, you show up to the river and... You don't tie the bounce rig on immediately. No. You want to, yeah, but you don't. Yeah, I, right? I have some self-control. <laughs> He's got Goodness a little bit. gracious. So you show up to the river a little bit, and you're like, all right. You're trying to figure out the depth so you can get it yeah, in that so, strike. So zone. first I'm like, okay, what are the water conditions? Uh-huh. Uh, the water is pretty high today. Okay, I'm probably going to be nymphing. Uh, well, I just saw a fish rise. Okay, now we have some potential for some dry fly eats. It's a double bounce rig. If you see the nymph rise, or a, a nymph rise, a fish rise, it's a double bounce for Alex. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> See a fish rise. All right, we have some potential for some top water action. I'm gonna tie on a dry dropper rig. Uh-huh. If I'm not seeing any fish rising, the water's pretty high, it's pretty deep. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go standard nymph rig. Mm-hmm. If that's not working, sometimes I'll go to the bounce rig because I don't know what happens. Sometimes that thing works magic. I don't know what it is, yeah. but that's what happened the other day at the river is I had tried a dry dropper. I had tried a standard nymph. I just wasn't really catching fish, but oh. they were going crazy everywhere. And so I'm like, all right, I see lots of caddis on the water. I'm going to tie on a caddis emerger. Let's try to get it to the right depth. I threw on a bunch of split shot. I threw it in some faster water. Boom, 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 boom. I caught six fish in like 20 minutes as soon as I tied that. Yeah. Up. But how do you know what the... How do you know what the the right depth is, though? How do you trial know and error. Trial is? and error. Yeah, yeah, that's a question we actually get all the time is, how do I know the depth of the water? I mean, I don't have x-ray vision. I don't uh-huh. have a measuring tape out there. <laughs> I, I mean, I'll throw, I, I do my best guess, right? Uh-huh. I look at the water. I go, oh, it's probably like five, six feet. I set up my rig. I put some split shot on there. I'm like, I... I mean, it, it also comes with experience, right? Yep. I can look at some water and I'm like, that's moving pretty fast. I'm probably going to have to add a little bit more split shot today. I'm going to have to use some heavier yep. flies to get those down because it's moving so fast. And so really it just comes down to taking my best guess and then making little micro adjustments. Yeah, so if I see that my indicator is just zipping by really fast, I'm like, okay, I need to get deeper or I need mm-hmm. to move that indicator up ahead of the fly. And, and so there's a bunch of little adjustments that you can make. And, and that's what gets the flies into the strike zone. Mm-hmm. And that's really, that's, that's the point I wanted to make here. It was as a beginner angler, focus on where are those fish hanging out and adjust your rigs and your flies according to where you think the fish are. Yeah. 
And would you say it's a good rule of thumb that like bottom third and top third of the water column and kind of ignore that middle third most of the time? I would say most of the time. Yeah. 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 So if, if you're struggling, like you're, you want your dry dropper, if, you're, if that's what you're fishing, you want that nymph to be in like the top third of the water. Or if you're going to nymph, you want your nymphs to be in the bottom third of the water. So close to the riverbed. That's just kind of a good all around uh, rule of thumb. I've actually never by. heard that. Yeah, that's interesting. So that makes sense. So it's kind of where they're at, though. Yeah. So yeah, I would say they're either closer to the bottom or they're yeah. eating off the top most of the time. Yeah, they're not gonna just hang out in the middle. Usually, it's just yeah. kind of a, sometimes in like pools and stuff. Yeah, that kind of no man's land. A little yeah, bit. but yeah. I would say that's right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, are are you off your soapbox? Do I? Yes, you All are right. allowed to continue thank you see i'm telling you guys tough boss to work as for long these days as you never bring up the bounce rate ever again <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so the last lesson that i want to impart to everybody is catching and releasing fish and a little bit about conservation this is something that's really important for new anglers to know and again i'm not preaching i'm not coming from a, a holier than thou Point of view. Spencer's the guy who will call you out on social media and leave nasty comments. So oh, watch out. hundred percent. Cause I love <laughs> social media so much. I'm, <laughs> I'm practically Mr. Twitter, you know, just kidding. We it, keep going. Cause this is definitely something that yeah. beginner anglers need to know. So uh, I've seen a lot of pictures lately in some of the groups and forums of newbies and they've got the fish laying on rocks or laying in the grass to take pictures of it. Poor little fella. And the the angler and the fish. Yeah, and the guy's posting it. And he has no clue. Yeah, he right? has no idea. What's and about he's just to about to get roasted, and yeah. and then it's also no good for the fish. And and I, we give ourselves kind of a bad rap because we're like, oh, you got to protect it, and you you should probably just not even fish. You know, you should just look at the fish, right? Cut your cut the points your hooks off, and just feel them take it, and that's all you really need. You know. <laughs> I heard a story about a steelheader who was so good that he would cut the points of his hooks off and just, he wanted just to feel the hook of the steelhead. That's it. Well, that's, yeah, that's the next level. And I think the story was BS, <laughs> uh, but you know, I've heard that kind of story uh, before. And, and that's not what I'm saying to do. I'm saying, take care of it. Right. When you catch that fish, you want to release it. Don't lay them on the bank. Don't lay them on a rock. That's not good for the fish that will lead that fish most likely dying. And even if it swims off, that doesn't mean that it's not going to die. The mortality rate for fish that uh, are, are placed on rocks or on the grass like that is exponentially higher than if they're released properly. Yeah. I would say beginners don't, don't know that. Right. Yeah, And, like, and it's not, and I'm not, I'm not coming down on these beginners yeah. like, Oh, you idiot. Blah, blah, blah. I'm just like, Hey, just because the fish swam away, doesn't mean that it's going to live. Yep. This is just the information. You want to keep doing this? You you want to keep fly fishing? Awesome. We hundred percent want that for you too. Totally. Just take care of the fish, right? And we don't. We ugh, I hate seeing those comments on social media where a new angler posts that picture. Yep. And there's fifty comments of anglers just roasting them and being. Yep. They're honestly like super mean. Oh yeah. And I mean, it's kind of funny sometimes, but in all honesty, like it's me. Yeah. It, it, and you talk about easy ways to drive people out of seriously, sport. Seriously, like you, yeah. you post, you're so excited. You just caught your first fish on a yep. fly rod. You take a picture of it. You post it on social media, and then everyone gives you so much hatred. Yeah, like, well, that's just that's not what we want. And so, no. I, what are some What are some things that beginners can do to make sure that that fish stays alive? So, number one thing: get your hands wet before you touch the fish. Trout, especially, they've got a protective slime layer that actually protects them from like diseases and whatnot. So definitely make sure you get your hands wet before you touch that fish. Uh, keep them in the water as much as possible. I, I'm in the habit now of really, if I pull the fish out of the water, it's five seconds or less. Yeah, That's my goal. And I like to leave them in the water for pictures. If I take pictures, uh, we don't do a whole lot of I don't do a whole lot of pictures personally anymore. They I just, look cooler anyways when that water's dripping off of them. Yeah, it, it looks pretty cool. Uh, always use a rubberized net as well because yeah. the cloth-based nets will actually remove the slime layer off the fish, so that's bad for them. 
don't squeeze them when you're trying to hold them either. I know they're slippery, but they actually are a little bit less cantankerous if you don't squeeze them. If you just support yeah. them gently, you'll find they're a little bit easier to handle that way. And it, I think it, I just thought of this. Yeah. If you're catching smaller fish, I don't think the barbs as important. You can just take your forceps and smash down that barb and it makes getting the hook out so yep. much easier and faster. Yeah. And, and that's the last one. Like if they've swallowed that fly a bunch, just cut the fly. The hook will rust out. The fish will be fine. Yep. Just cut the fly off and tie a new fly on. It, it's not the end of the world. That's worst case scenario. But yeah. And, and it really just comes down to treat the fish well, take care of it. That way it can grow and be caught by somebody else. Maybe even you, you know, when it's maybe, a 25 it's, yeah, inch, 25 inch, man. Yeah, exactly. Got to keep them. So that's, that's, that's my pitch is just understand how to capture and release fish before you go out and fish and then do your best to practice it as best as you possibly can. If we're going to do this stuff, let's do it right. And they're not making new trout habitat these days, you know, so we, we've got a finite amount of the stuff yeah that we just need to take as good care of it as we possibly can that that should always be our goal totally agree and and one last thing and then i'll shut up uh, <laughs> especially right now we're in the middle of summer when we're recording this don't fish when the water gets over 68 degrees fahrenheit that when the water is that warm it's actually really a lot more stressful on the fish and it can lead to the fish dying. And you'll notice it. If you catch a, I mean, you put your hand in the water, it's pretty warm. You catch a fish and instead of it like fighting like crazy, like they normally do, kind of just lays over and like you just drag it to the net. Yeah, just kind of dies. Yeah, and that's when you know it's probably too warm. Yeah, and me and Alex were out last week on this little river that's wonderful, wonderful little fishery. Uh, that was so sad, man. And the bugs were going nuts. <laughs> The hatches were great, but we got in the water, and the first thing I said was, dude, this is really warm. And then we caught a couple of fish, and they just did that thing where they just laid over and died and came to the net super easy with no fight. And we ended up leaving that river to go somewhere else because it was too warm to fish. And it sucks. Like, it's not fun to walk away from that, but I'd rather do that than kill a whole bunch of fish. Just And we actually got rewarded. We went to a different yeah. river. Caught 20 fish in like an hour. It was awesome. Alex caught 20. I caught, <laughs> he caught like 18. I got like two. And it was, yeah, one I, was of my little, I was using the bounce rig. He was. <laughs> it was one of my little uh, cutthroat streams, my little, one of my secret little streams I took him to. And he had the uh, audacity to outfish me on my own stream. Dude, that CDC little pheasant tail, man. Yeah, they were keyed in on that thing. They were. And it was a dry dropper, by yeah. the way, for, uh, for the record. For the record. <laughs> All right. I think, Alex, you've got one more tip, and then we can wrap this thing up, huh? We're yep. getting a little long in the tooth here. We are. So, I know. we got to get to our announcement. I know. We've got a giveaway. big announcement oh. giveaway. Woo. All right. <laughs> Last lesson, Alex. Let's hear it. You're passing up fish in the river as a beginner. We are? You are. As a beginner, you are passing up fish because you think fish aren't in that type of water. Uh -huh. So... We were just on this little stream the other wow. day and there was a pocket that was about two feet wide uh -huh. and Spencer threw his flies up in there. And he actually, <laughs> before he cast, he was like, there's no fish in there. And I was like, a hundred percent. There's going to be a fish in there. How much you want to bet? And we, I mean, we should have placed it. We should have put some money. Yeah, on, We should have yeah. put some we money should've. on it. Spencer casts the fly up there. Boom. Biggest fish of the day in that small, tiny little pocket that yep. he, he just was going to pass up. And so you're welcome, by the way. And so as a beginner, you just, you don't really understand exactly where those fish are hiding or holding yep, in, you don't. in the water. And I, I mean, I learn this all the time in pocket water. And I, I mean, we can talk about Pocket water on another occasion, but um, exactly what that is. But it's basically there's an obstruction. You have slower water behind a rock or something. That's yeah. pocket water. And so a lot of beginners, they'll just look at that. Oh, the water's moving too fast or there's no way there's going to be a fish in there. And lo and behold, there's fish in there. man. Yep. And so I would say that's something that beginners can learn is 
where exactly fish are holding the water and and how to fish different water types. You'll hear the terms pocket water, riffles, eddies, runs. What else? Glides. Yeah. And pools. Yeah. Pools. All that stuff, yeah, yeah. All that stuff. And so there are different types of water and and different rigs and different ways to fish them. And we're actually gonna the announcement's gonna help with this. Believe me, it will. It will. <laughs> But just as a beginner, maybe reading a book or watching some videos, maybe about this topic. Alex, are you dropping a hand? I don't know what you're talking about, Spencer. <laughs> but learning about current, learning about seams, learning about all those different types of water. Yeah. It's going to help you look at a river and f- be able to find where those fish are holding. And it's going to elevate your levels as an anger, like angler like none other. Yeah, 100%. Awesome. Well, I I think we've tantalized the audience enough, Alex. I think it's time. Oh man. I think I think it's time to go ahead. I don't, I don't know if they're ready. Should we keep? Sh- Do you have a number seven? I, I don't. <laughs> I didn't prepare a number seven. I'm oh, sorry. Crap. All right. <laughs> fine. We can we can announce it. All right. I what th- do you got for us, Spencer? You know what? I think we're gonna cue up a drum roll here real quick. Okay. Okay. All cool. right. So. Over the last 18 months, we have spent our time writing, filming, and the editing a beginner fly fishing master class. You will be able to go from beginner to intermediate fly angler in like 30 videos. Yeah, this is, it really is. <laughs> like we've got this, this ain't no just like average run of the mill course. This thing is in depth. We've got videos on everything that you need to know in order to be successful while you're out on the water. And in fact, we were out filming last week and Berkeley mentioned something after Alex and I got done with a bit. He's like, dude, everything you guys just covered took me like five years to learn. And that's really what we're trying to do is we're trying to not cheat the learning curve, but we're trying to make it so much simpler that you can go out there and have a lot more success a lot quicker because you're you're learning the things that are important to know. We took all the information and we just kind of paired it back and said, what is absolutely vital to know as a beginner and how is that going to make them better? And if it doesn't make you a better angler, we didn't include it in the beginning fly fishing master. It's very actionable. I like that word. Yeah. Where you can actually watch the video go out to the river and implement exactly what you learned in the video right Mm -hmm. then and there. There's no fluff. And we've, we've really tried to take complex topics and simplify them. Yep, exactly. So to go along with that, is it coming out? Is it coming out on the 19th? Our first episode, Alex, is that what we decided? I'm super close to getting done editing the video. We're going to, we're going to do it. We're going to push it on the 19th Sunday. Sunday, July, July 19th. That that's not a Sunday, dude. That's that's today. That's Wednesday. Oh my gosh. So so you mean <laughs> Sunday? Sunday. July 23rd. 23rd. Sorry. <laughs> this podcast comes out on the 19th. Yes, that, it does. Holy. <laughs> sorry. Oh. I drove all the way to Wyoming today. I made a pit stop, did some fishing. Yeah. My apologies. Yeah. He's Sunday, a July 23rd. The first module and the first section of the second module will be launched yeah on so youtube we're dropping this stuff it's going to be on youtube so you want to be subscribed to us on youtube that's the only place to find this yep. we're not charging for it it's free 100 totally free but you do have to be you know you're gonna to have to go to our youtube to find it and to celebrate this we're giving away a starter pack what yeah i didn't know that oh uh Berkeley is this coming out of your paycheck <laughs> <laughs> i sure hope not <laughs> what's in a starter pack alex why should people be excited that we're giving one of these away to celebrate the launch of our beginner fly fishing masterclass. So our VFC starter pack Uh is everything you need to start fly fishing Uh in one package. Uh So we, we, we started with fly collections and people kept asking the question like, Oh, what rod should I get? What reel should I get? What else do I need to start Mm -hmm. fly fishing? And we were like, all right, let's come out with a starter pack. So Uh we did all the sourcing. We, we designed the rod. We designed the reel. We got all the accessories that you needed. We we got a bag. We got a net. Like 
There's nippers. There's, there's split nippers, shot, split shot, floating indicators, even like tippet holders and floating caddies, all the little accessories that you don't really need, but makes it nice while yep. you're out there. And we put it all together. Unfortunately, it doesn't come with waders and boots or polarized sunglasses, which I would consider a need, but we're working on those. Don't yeah. worry. <laughs> we've, we've got stuff in the pipeline, but it really is. It's like 99% of everything you need to get out on the water. And we're just giving it away. Yep. We're going to give it away to yeah. one lucky person and they can get that starter pack and watch the master class and hopefully start catching fish right yeah. out the gate. I, I think it's going to make a difference. I think the, the, Master class gonna make a difference for every beginner, though. It's I'm, I'm really, honest. I'm super excited about it. it. it I am too. We we put our heart and soul into this thing, man. There's tons of jokes. <laughs> you guys are gonna get to meet two alter egos of mine <laughs> through, throughout the show. We've had some fun out there. Yeah, we've cracked ourselves up. Maybe you guys think they're dumb, but it, <laughs> it's, it's pretty funny. I mean, you think the jokes on the podcast are good? <laughs> just wait until there's. <laughs> just wait. All right. Now, how do you get? Uh, how do you get entered to win this starter pack? How, how do you do that? Well, it's pretty simple. The giveaway is going to run for two weeks. It goes from today, July 19th, to August 2nd. To gain entries, really simple. What you need to do, you need to leave a comment on our Instagram, TikTok, YouTube posts with how long you've been fishing. There'll be posts with all this stuff in it. On those platforms, leave a comment on that post with how long you've been fishing. That gets you one entry. If you want two entries, you're going to subscribe to the podcast on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. You get five entries if you submit a question to the podcast. And there's always a link for that in the podcast description. And then you're going to get 10 entries. What? 10? 10 entries. If you share this podcast episode on social media and tag us in the post. They should be rewarded for that. They, they really should be. So, again, one entry. Leave a comment on our Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube post about this release with how long you've been fishing. You're going to get two entries if you subscribe to the podcast. You get five entries if you submit a question to the podcast. And you get 10 entries if you share this podcast episode on social media and tag us in the post because this uh and ideally, you're going to say something like, hey, they're launching this new thing. You know, it's wonderful. Here's a podcast that explains what they're doing. That's what we want you guys to tag us in and share it. It's going to get the most entries. Like I said, this thing runs for two weeks. So you've got two weeks to get these entries. And, and you can do more than one thing. So you can yeah. do all the comments. You can subscribe. You can submit a question and you can do the post. So those yep. will you'll get, what is that, 17, 18 entries. Eight, yeah, 18 entries. So there's a lot of opportunity here, not a whole lot of work on your part, but it's going to help spread the word about the starter series, uh, about our fly fishing masterclass, about the podcast, to spread the good word of EFC, right? That's what we're about. So hopefully everybody's excited. Stay tuned to YouTube on the 23rd of July, and you're going to see the first, what is it, two episodes roll out? Yep. So the first two episodes of the beginning fly fishing masterclass are going to roll out and we are stoked to hear what everybody has to say what y'all have to think about them so please make sure that you're hitting us up on social once you've seen it and telling us what you think yeah we'd love to chat with you guys yeah so in the meantime be excited have yourself a diet coke and uh that lines everybody coke zero <laughs> uh diet coke we'll settle this at another time <laughs> Oh, shoot. Thanks a bunch, everybody, and uh, tight lines.